Hey everyone, today's video is on the surgical management of rectal cancer, or as I like to think of it, rectal cancer is kind of colon cancer plus. So this is a pretty logical follow-up to our last video on colon cancer. If you really understand your basics of colon cancer, then rectal cancer management is almost exactly the same, but with a few key additions. So I would recommend going back, watching the other video on colon cancer if you haven't already, really getting that down, and then coming to this video and learning what are those few additional differences that we add on for rectal cancer management, primarily just because the rectum is in such a more confined space with a bunch of key other structures associated with it. Again, I want to emphasize that with these cancer videos, it's so easy to get deep, deep into the weeds, and I went deep into, into the NCN guidelines prior to making this video, and uh, honestly, probably deeper than I belonged in. This will not be perfect. Uh, probably in a couple of years, the guidelines will change again and some things might be different, but hopefully it's a useful resource nonetheless, talking about really the basics uh, and how you can kind of approach a basic heuristic to thinking about the management of rectal cancer. But enough talking, let's get into it. So the topics we're gonna cover today, again, we're gonna talk about the basic staging workup for rectal cancer. Uh, we'll review the TNM staging. We'll talk about which patients are candidates for surgery up front versus neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy, uh, what our basic surgical options are for rectal cancer. There are a few more of those than there were for colon cancer. We'll talk about some unique situations and again, summarize what we talk about. All right, so again, staging workup. I like to break it down into my three categories of labs, imaging, and other tests. So for rectal cancer, again, the labs, we're just thinking CEA levels. Imaging, it starts to get a bit more intense though, and we're going to start seeing the uh, focus on rectal cancer, really getting good local staging because the local extent of the disease can make such a resection, such a resection, such a, an impact on the level and type of resection we do and the overall treatment strategy. So you are, you're imaging, you are going to start with, once again, colon cancer plus, you'll get that CT chest, abdomen, pelvis with IV contrast, that CT oncology, but you'll usually also get some or you will get some additional imaging of the pelvis, specifically, most commonly, a pelvic MRI. Another option, if pelvic MRI is not available, is an endorectal ultrasound, an EUS. But that's more operator-dependent and less available than MRI. So since MRI is more widely available and a little bit more standardized, that's typically thought to be the standard of care for local imaging of rectal cancer. Then other, remember in colon and rectal cancer, other primarily means scopes. So of course we want a full colonoscopy to look for synchronous lesions in the colon. And we also for rectal cancer want to add on a rigid proctoscopy. And the reason for that is it's really hard to measure distances with a flexible endoscope. So a rigid proctoscope gives you a good measure of your distance. Uh, from your anal verge of that rectal tumor, which is going to uh, impact your resection plan, which we'll talk about more in the future. All right, so to review TNM staging, here's a spoiler. It's the exact same as colon cancer. So let's just go back and do a quick review. I like to make this as simple as possible. So for each level, I want the one word that's associated with the can what level the cancer is at. So for TIS or tumor in situ, that word is the mucosa. That's cancer confined to the mucosa. T1, tumor is penetrated into the submucosa. T2, tumor is penetrated into the muscularis propria. T3, it's past the muscularis propria, but has not gone through the serosa yet. T4A has gone through the serosa, but not into any surrounding structures. And T4B has gone into a surrounding organ. All right, so mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria, past the muscularis propria, serosa, and organ. I think uh, that's a pretty simple way to remember all these things. All right, and then N and M stage. Uh, this one is, again, exactly the same. And of course, a little bit more simple than the T staging. So N0 has no nodes. N1 has one to three nodes. And N2 has greater than four nodes. And of course, M0 and one, zero meaning no metastases and one meaning distant metastases. All right, and so once we have our TNM staging, 
who is a candidate for surgery versus neoadjuvant. And the patients with the least significant disease ha have the potential for having surgery first as opposed to neoadjuvant therapy. So let's talk about that first. First of all, if somebody has distant METs, they are unlikely to have surgery first. So surgery first patients are generally M0. If they have nodes, they're not going to get surgery first. So they are also N0. And then you don't want your uh, T stage to be too progressed either for surgery. So either T1 or T2, N0, M0 disease, those patients can get surgery first. So one way of saying who gets neoadjuvant is everyone else. But another easy way to remember it is if your T stage is three or greater, there should be consideration of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And certainly if uh, they have positive lymph nodes on there staging workup. And remember, this is rectal cancer, colon plus. Uh, so your neoadjuvant therapy is not just chemotherapy, but it's chemotherapy and radiation typically. Again, we want to highlight the differences from colon cancer in this video. So first of all, we're just talking about neoadjuvant therapy, right? That was quite rare for most operative colon cancers. And then we're also talking about radiation, which we often didn't use in colon cancer either. A little bit of a note on timing. Um, once a patient's received neoadjuvant therapy, there's kind of a golden window when you want to operate. You generally want to wait for four to eight weeks after surgery, and that will allow your inflammation to go down from the radiation. But you don't want to wait more than 12 weeks because at that point, the fibrosis from the inflammation related to the radiation starts to set in. So there's kind of this golden window in between week four to eight and 12, where you typically want to do your uh, surgery following neo neoadjuvant therapy. All right, and then which surgical options do we have once we've either decided that the patient gets surgery up front or decided that someone who's gotten neoadjuvant, how do we decide which operation that they get? So you have three surgical options. The first is a transanal local excision. The second is a low anterior resection or LAR. And the third is an abdomino perineal resection or APR. And to make it super simple, Highly selected T1 lesions, we'll go over this more in another slide, can potentially get just a transanal excision. However, it's also appropriate for them to get a more formal excision, such as an LAR, low anterior resection, or an APR. Again, we'll go over the details of each of these procedures on future slides. However, once you get T2 and above, you're really only talking about formal resections with LARs and APRs. All right, so briefly to talk a bit about transanal local excision. Uh, this basically means going in through the anus and just removing the cancer uh, off the surface of the anal mucosa. Uh, if you think about, it's almost like going in to just excise a polyp from the anus. It's really just a superficial excision. It does not get any surrounding lymph node tissue, which is a major weakness of this operation. You don't get adequate staging because you don't get nodes and there's an increased risk of uh, recurrence because of that. That said, uh, especially in patients that are not uh, good operative candidates, this is a much less invasive operation than the transabdominal LARs and APRs that we talked about earlier. So the primary thing I want to highlight here is some of the criteria for what might make somebody a candidate for a transanal local excision. And there's a lot of threes in these criteria. So the first criteria is this must be a pretty small lesion, so T1. Um, Another criteria is that there should be less than 30% of the circumference of the bowel involved. That's one of those threes. The cancer should be less than three centimeters in size. Your margin should be greater than three millimeters. Um, other things, there should be no lymphovascular invasion, LVI, or perineural invasion. Uh, the tumor should not be poorly differentiated. It should be well or moderately differentiated. And finally, there should be no lymphadenopathy, obvious, on your preoperative imaging. So again, 
this is an option. Uh, is it the best option? It really depends on the patient, how well they'll tolerate the surgery, how much longer of a life expectancy they, do they have, et cetera. But this is definitely should be viewed as the exception and not the rule for T1 lesions because you have to meet all those criteria we just talked about. All right, now to probably the most common or most ideal full resection for colorectal, or sorry, rectal cancer, the LAR, or low anterior resection. So if we draw out a colon here, it's gonna be a very stylized colon. It comes down here into the rectum, right? Colon, to rectum here. So ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, rectum. So an LAR is essentially just like any other colon resection, except it occurs in the distal colon and involves at least a component of the rectum. For example, something like this. Uh, the actual definition of a low anterior resection involves a uh, violation of the anterior peritoneal reflection over the rectum. If your colon dissection goes down that low, you've technically performed a low anterior resection. Once you've excised this part of the colon, then you do typically a colorectal or coloanal anastomosis where you hook up your colon down here to either some residual rectum or the anus itself. And then... Um, a lot of times, depending on the depth or some other factors, you may or may not do a diverting loop ileostomy or some sort of proximal diversion to protect this anastomosis while it heals. Another key component of rectal cancer surgery is what's called the TME or the total mesorectal excision. Uh, this is all about a total on block removal of the mesorectum. So if we think about a rectum here, um, unlike the colon, where there's really a single mesentery coming off of, on a single location and the rest of the colon is essentially bare, the rectum is almost wrapped in its, or enveloped in its mesentery. And a total mesorectal ex excision involves excising all that mes mesorectum with the specimen on block. And that resection will include any vascular structures that are in here in the mesorectum, any lymphatics, the fatty tissue, and then this mesorectal fascia on the outside. As you can tell, this is obviously quite hard to draw, so I have a picture here. Uh, this is uh, kind of your transverse view looking down. Uh, you see this fascia that surrounds the mesorectum that Heald called it the holy plane. And you're kind of coring down, getting all this tissue on the inside that has the blood vessels, the lymph nodes, um, and hopefully all of your tumor contained inside of it. When we talk about a total mesorectal excision, that means you excise all the way down to the pelvic floor and take out all of that mesorectum. That's generally what's done with most of these cancers. However, there's also what's called a tumor-specific mesorectal excision. Uh, and in that case, you core down just to your distal margin past that tumor. Remember, just like colon cancer, an ideal margin would be something like five centimeters. So if you have a really high rectal lesion and you're able to core down greater than five or equal to five centimeters past it, you can just core off that level of mesorectum and that would be a tumor specific excision. excision. Uh, but for most cancers, you're gonna go all the way down to the pelvic floor and take the total mesorectum. So when can you not use an LAR? Obviously, this is going to be preferred over your other approach, which is an APR. Um, briefly, the reason it's preferred is because an APR is going to involve taking the anal sphincter complex and leave patients with a permanent colostomy, as well as probably some worse continence and sexual function due to the pelvic dissection. Um, and so you can generally use an LAR as long as you have at least a two centimeter margin from the surgical anal canal, which again, if you need a refresher, you can go back and watch our anorectal anatomy video, but is generally defined as the length of the internal external anal sphincters. So if you're able to get a two centimeter margin between your tumor and the top of the sphincter complex, you are generally able to excise there, take out your specimen and then do an anastomosis. However, if not, then you might have to go to our Next surgical option, the APR. So an APR stands for abdominal perineal res resection. We've drawn our rectum here, coming down into our anus. 
remember our surgical anal canal right there, just based on the level of the sphincters. And then this is the anal verge. This is essentially an LAR that doesn't stop. So if you can imagine LAR, you might do your TME down to here and then cut off just above the anal canal and take out this specimen. In the case of an APR, you just keep going all the way to the perianal skin. You still do a TME. You certainly would not skip your TME. You core down with your TME to get all that nice mesorectum. Uh, but then you also take the entire anal sphincter complex and some perianal skin. All this gets excised. You actually suture the skin to itself. The patient does not have an anus following this procedure. And then you take your proximal resected colon margin and you bring that out to the skin as a permanent end colostomy. So again, this increased um, extent of the pelvic dissection, the permanence of the ostomy, as well as the higher complication rate from this procedure, uh, a lot of that related to issues with this APR wound, uh, make an LAR preferable uh, if you can do it. But if you have a really low rectal cancer or a cancer that involves an anal sphincter complex, you may not have any choice uh, but to perform an APR. All right, so going back to review, what are surgical options? If there's a T1 lesion, if it's a really highly selected, non-high-risk feature T1 lesion, you could do a transanal local excision. However, you can also do an LAR and an APR. Um, the LAR in particular spares the permanent ostomy and uh, the morbidity of an APR, and it will also sample your lymph nodes, which is generally, uh, of course, a staple of cancer operations and why it's often preferred over transanal local excision, except in high-risk patients. Uh, and then for your T2 and greater diseases, those are essentially candidates for LAR ideally, but if they're too close to the sphincter complex, uh, potentially an APR. Again, both uh, colon cancer and rectal cancer are very similar in patients that have metastatic disease that's still resectable, which means either isolated liver or lung mets. Those patients could have combined operations uh, with low anterior resections or abdominal perineal resections along with lip and lung resections. Those are not, by definition, unresectable. All right, so you've had your surgery. Now we're in the post-operative period. Which patients are going to need adjuvant therapy? So first, we have to determine what operation did they actually have. So if they just had that transanal excision, that kind of minimally invasive excision of cancer without sampling any lymph nodes, those patients are all NX disease. You don't know their nodal status. And so if you get lucky and you get a T1 cancer where your final path has no high-risk features, then you're done. There's no adjuvant therapy. However, if you get a T1 with high-risk features or one, or a T2 lesion, those patients, you should strongly consider taking them back and doing an LAR or an APR to truly sample their disease pathologically and provide a more curative resection. However, if somebody is a poor operative candidate that wouldn't tolerate an LAR and APR, if they have a high risk T1 lesion or T2, those patients may be referred for adjuvant therapy. Patients that got a more standard LAR or APR resection, those patients, again, similar to colon cancer, if they have greater than T3 or greater than N1 disease, they get referred for adjuvant chemo or adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. Remember, radiotherapy is part of the cocktail for rectal cancer much more than colon cancer. All right, and reviewing again our principles of surgery, we talked about this quite a bit in our slides previously about the LAR and APR procedures. Uh, but just to review, we generally want two to five centimeter margins. Obviously, we'd prefer five if we could, but when we're talking about those really distal lesions, we're willing to sacrifice all the way down to something like two centimeters if we're able to give someone an LAR as opposed to an APR and spare them both the morbidity and the permanent ostomy associated with the APR. We're still looking for 12 lymph nodes and another change from colon cancer surgery is the uh, utility of diversion. So, of course, in colon cancer, it's quite rare. In rectal cancer, it's relatively common. The two situations that come to mind are APRs. Of course, those have a, an end colostomy, 
However, um, even in LARs where you, you do a really low pelvic anastomosis, oftentimes if a patient had a leak there, that could be quite a devastating complication and people have died from pelvic sepsis. So frequently you will do your LARs, your low anterior resections, and you will add on a diversion procedure, typically a diverting loop ileostomy, where you bring up a loop of ileum to divert the fecal stream. And that way, even if there is a leak, it is less severe. The patient's less likely to get very ill from their pelvic sepsis. And the advantage of the loop ileostomy is that can usually be taken down in a relatively minor procedure, something like three months or so after their operation. Another indication for a diverting loop, in addition to a really low resection and a low anastomosis, might be uh, new adjuvant radiation. A lot of times people are concerned about uh, how well tissue heals after radiation. So new adjuvant chemo radiation is often a reason that surgeons will choose to divert patients. All right, we've talked about quite a bit. We have just a few more things to discuss before we wrap up this video. And the first is obstructing cancers. We briefly mentioned this in the colon cancer video, but just to review, anytime you have a large bowel obstruction frequently caused by cancer, either colon or rectal cancer, you need to, to decide, is that small bowel obstruction an emergency or not? Uh, we discuss this in much more detail in our small bowel obstruction video, but essentially a non-emergent bowel obstruction, kind of your typical adhesive bowel obstruction is actually not a surgical emergency. And we're usually able to treat that by sticking an NG tube in the stomach, sucking out all those juices, allowing everything to decompress, uh, and either that treats it by itself or it gives you time before you have to do your operation. However, certain obstructions are surgical emergencies, in particular, closed loop obstructions. And large bowel obstructions, which of course involve the colon and rectum, those are very high risk of being closed loop obstruction. And that's because of your ileocecal valve. So again, if I'm going to do my terribly stylized colon, this is your terminal ileum entering the colon. There's a bit of a valve here. It doesn't look like this, but I'm just drawing a valve, right? And the purpose of that valve is to allow contents to go through from your ileum to your colon, but not to reflux back into your ileum. If your valve works, you don't get any of that reflux. That's called a competent ileocecal valve. Normally, that's a good thing. You don't want stuff refluxing from your colon back into your small valve. However, um, in the case of a large bowel obstruction, you actually want that reflux to happen because if your colon's really swelled up because it's blocked somewhere out here, maybe by a tumor, and you've got all this back pressure building up, it's kind of nice if it releases back into the small bowel. This would be via an incompetent ileocecal valve because in that case, the small bowel can stretch out and take some of that burden and it can back up all the way to the stomach and get sucked out by an NG tube and kind of temporized with our typical management of a small bowel obstruction. However, a lot of patients have competent ileocecal valves. And if that's the case, that's turned your obstructing cancer into a surgical emergency. And how do you tell this? The easiest way is to look at your CT scan. And if you see a large dilated colon but your small bowel looks normal. It's not dilated. The stomach's not dilated. They're probably still nauseous and retching, but oftentimes they're not throwing anything up because there's not actually fluid there. You know, by definition, that your ileocecal valve must be competent because nothing's backing up into these small bowel loops. If you have significantly distended small bowel loops, then you're reassured again because you have an incompetent ileocecal valve. This is not as much of a surgical emergency. You can often NG tube decompress them and live to fight another day. But if it's competent, if this small bowel is normal and the colon's big, this is a surgical emergency. And what are you going to do about it? So you really have three treatment options. Historically, it was just surgery. Now we have a couple other options. So your first option is a stent. Your second option is a diverting colostomy, not ileostomy, but colostomy. We'll talk about why. And your final option is just your primary resection of that tumor. So first we'll talk about stents. For stents to work, they're a great option. They're good for um, either being a palliative option where the patient never has to undergo surgery, maybe in somebody with diffusely metastatic disease who's near the end of their life, or they can allow you to do a bowel prep in a more typical formal resection. 
uh, in a patient that is resectable. Uh, however, the cancer has to be in a place where they can reach and actually be able to place a stent across. Uh, it can't be too low of a distal rectal cancer or else the stent's extremely uncomfortable for the patient if they can feel that sensation. Um, but if you can place a stent, that's frequently a great option. If you can't, uh, diverting colostomy is probably your next best bet. In this case, it has to be a colostomy, often a loop colostomy, because if you have that patent ileocecal valve and you do an ileostomy, you've decompressed the small valve, but the colon contents aren't getting back to that small valve anyway. If they had an incompetent ileocecal valve, if that valve was letting everything back up, you could do a diverting loop ileostomy. But I'd say most often, we're talking again about that surgical emergency where there's a competent ileocecal valve. You're going to bring up either a loop of ascending or most likely transverse colon uh, for your diverting colostomy to decompress that patient. And then, you know, you can go and get your more formal staging, et cetera, and do your normal workup and treatment of your colon or rectal cancer. Then your final option uh, would be a resection where you go in there and in the process of decompressing the patient, you actually take out the primary tumor and do some sort of reconstruction as well. All right, a lot of data. Let's just go back and hit the high points. So you're a surgeon, a patient comes to you with rectal cancer. What do you do? Step one, staging. You wanna make sure they've got their labs, their CEA, you've got your imaging, your CT, Oncology, chest, abdomen, pelvis. You also want your local imaging, your pelvic MRI, or in some situations, an EUS, and your scopes. You want a colonoscopy and you want your rigid proctoscopy uh, to, this should hopefully make more sense now why the rigid proctoscopy is so important. You want to measure that distance uh, of the tumor from the anal verge, from the anal canal, and that will help you plan your LAR versus APR decision making. Once they've been fully staged, you have to decide, does this patient get surgery first or are they a better candidate for neoadjuvant therapy? Remember, neoadjuvant T3 or greater or N1 or greater are typically candidates for neoadjuvant, and that is chemo radiotherapy, not just chemotherapy. Now, talking about somebody who's a candidate for surgery and they've either don't need neoadjuvant or they've already gotten it, your options are transanal excisions, Remember, that's only for highly selected T1 cancers. Um, and then your more typical resections are LARs, low anterior resections, or APRs. LAR is just being kind of like a colon resection, but involving a really low pelvic dissection. And APR is for those cases where you don't have the two centimeters or enough space uh, between your anal sphincter complex and your cancer, where you have to take that as well and leave your patient with an end colostomy. No matter which operation you're doing, remember your TME, that total knees or axle excision is so important for preventing recurrence, improving survival. And then for patients that need adjuvants, again, adjuvant therapy, again, that's at T3 and N1 or greater cutoff. And that is it. Again, a whirlwind. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too much data. Hopefully it's clear. Um, this is this video is for educational purposes only. Do not use to diagnose or treat any disease. This is not clinical advice, and we will see you next time.